Hi, yeah, so I'm Samantha Han or Sam. Um, so largely I sit in the Information Services Division at UCL, which is Central IT. Um, I actually work in Digital Education, which is the e-learning function, but two days a week I'm, I'm on loan to Research IT Services. And with them, I, I do learning design work. So we had a project bid accepted about a year ago, saying that, okay, so we're really big into open science, open research, we have big research computing platforms, but we need our research students and our PhD students to be able to use those platforms. So there is a series of programs that get delivered face to face, but we're struggling to meet the demand. So they kind of said, right, so let's create some online versions of those things. And, and it's that kind of process I'm going to talk you through today and some of the decisions and some of the ethics and the complications that goes with that. So open was easy for us. Um, we use Jupyter Notebooks, we're strong carpentry instructors, we're founders of the Software Sustainability Institute, we help build the Jupyter Notebooks, we help build Python plugins. Um, you know, I myself have been involved with various stuff with Mozilla, between MozFest, I'm coaching for the Global Sprint, I went through Open Leaders cohort. So Open for us was, was a no-brainer, it's, it's something that we do, something that we believe in, in terms of our science and our research and our tool base but actually then building open tools it is kind of slightly different from there and the first thing was like great open but how well we wanted it accessible as in people could access it so building something within our moodle behind a login that only internal people could access didn't fit right. We're part of all these other things and these collaborations, so putting it behind an issue of login wasn't quite right. But this is effectively internal staff CPD. So putting it on a slightly more prestigious outward facing platform wasn't quite right either. So we kind of did the other. So actually they're, they're GitHub pages. It's, it's hosted and it's built live online in GitHub, which is great, it's, it's findable and accessible. But what about the content? Well, that has to be accessible too, right? Everyone needs to be able to access that. So I worked very closely with our um, IT inclusion officer to the point where I said, we could have researchers from anywhere with any kind of needs that would need to be able to access this. So I've got a style sheet, it's a web page. So I got her to review them and to feed back on me. She herself is dyslexic. So we picked the most dyslexia-friendly style sheet. I also know there's a whole load of tools in that room that she manages to help people access the material. So we got people that use the Senate, the, the, the SEN Special Education Needs IT Suite, to test what we'd built. So it got ran through programs like JAWS. Um, the videos, we made sure that they were captioned. We put the transcript online as well. But for me, that was a no-brainer. I come from compulsory secondary education. I taught an awful lot of sets of students that contained a vast number of, of SEND students. So I was aware of dyslexia. I was aware of visual impairments. The first school I taught in had a hearing impairment unit. I actually had people sign whilst I was teaching. So I have a very wide accessibility background, and that actually formed part of my HEA fellowship application, that this was something I pushed. But it's something I had to get my colleague in, in research IT services to understand. They stand up and they teach using Jupyter Notebooks. So converting what you stand up and you talk at into something that's accessible for a lot of people online was, was quite a bit of work. And to get people to think through that it cannot just be black and white text and you send someone off to man pages. That, that, that's not learning. That, that needs a bit more to it. But also, what about inclusivity? You know, we have an agenda at UCL that we want to make our curriculum inclusive. The students push for liberating the curriculum program. It's something that we're now actively trying to push with a big institutional checklist. But all our names are British white names and all the places we reference are in England. Does that reflect everyone that's going to be using this stuff? So as a very basic step, we just like to change some names around. So, you know, we're not quite as inclusive as I'd like to be, but I hope that we're starting to push things in kind of the right direction with that. So we're trying very hard to think about the tools that we've got, how we present it, 
and how we make it inclusive. And on top of that, we, we've got licenses. So you've got the new license, the MIT license. These are mostly around software. They weren't quite relevant, but they're in the back of our heads because we're using tools. We built everything using open source tools that have these licenses. But then we had to have the debate about what license we wanted to put on it. Now, I personally, I kind of fall into the discrimination bit that David Wiley was talking about this morning. Because I don't necessarily want someone to make money out of something I've shared for the greater good for everyone else. So for me, I quite like releasing things personally under a non-commercial license. But this was a debate I had to have with colleagues in research IT services because they release everything as, as CC BY. And, and that's the license that we got. But we had to decide that as a group and we had to decide what way we were going. And I'm going to talk about my side hustle, which is this Mozilla Open Leaders Program, the Data Playground. And, and I had to decide on a license for that as well. And if people sign up to help me with that project, you know, that might have to be up for negotiation because we have our own sets of, of views on these things. As I said, I think it's for the great good. I'd rather people didn't make money. But I understand that sometimes you get further if you open it up for everyone and they can build on it and, and disseminate it. So it's one of those other things of the, you go, yeah, it's great, we'll share. How and, and what limits? It's, it's not as straightforward as we think. So what did we build? We built two, actually, we built three things, but only two of them are, are, are kind of live. Um, actually, it's all live. We just don't tell anyone about it until we're ready to ship, as it were. Um, so we did an introduction to research programming, and this, this is in Python. And we did an introduction to Unix shell. So all our HPCs are Unix-based systems. So unless you're comfortable with Unix, you can't use a HPC. It's all on the command line. So it's important that they understand the command line. And we built these things. So we got Pretty Blue. All of those videos, they're, they're actually sitting in YouTube. Um, they're kind, kind of hidden, sort of. But they have transcripts and they have closed caption. And you can switch the language around. We weren't too worried about it. So this is actually built with a thing called the Moria Framework from the University of Hawaii. So it's actually an open source framework. It uses Markdown. So I, I, I draft the pages in Markdown. I then run scripts that use Jekyll and Ruby and push it to GitHub. And you can see it developing live over time in GitHub. And, and it's there, and it's a fully open, clear practice. I tend to keep the repository closed while I do the development. But once, it, once it's ready, I hand it back over to the teams. But, but you can look at it at any time, and you can fork it. Just I kind of hide it until, so you can see what I'm doing, but you can't actually mess with the, the code base until we're done. So in, in terms of institutional usage, well, we've got kind of the two courses there. And we've got a, um, so, so we've got a Moodle instance at UCL. And we have a home for these in Moodle. People were asking for certificates. So if we're not seeing them face to face, we don't quite know if they've got it. So, so we built some summative quizzes. And, and if you pass the quiz, then, then you can get a certificate. And you can kind of prove that you've met the CPD level. Um, so we've got people have kind of gone in. So 37 users have gone in, looked at the materials 89 times. It's, it's not great. We've got kind of 4,000 staff at UCL, a chunk of them researchers and postgraduates. So, so they're not really kind of coming in. And, and this has had a very soft launch since November. So it's still early doors. Um, we've had a few more looking at the research program with Python. But again, not as much as we'd like. So we need to push a little bit more. In terms of global reach, actually, we've got people in Russia, North America looking at it. And, and it looks great. In Britain, we've had up to 101 people. So this is kind of findable. I did ask people in my other networks. So external, so ADIS list to do a bit of testing for me. The feedback table for testing was actually a Google Doc that, that got shared with a research programming hub. So it got shared with people from um, the Crick Institute and, and other partner researchers. So we kind of did pretty much everything, open it and collaboratively. But when we actually look at it, um, this 73.2%, that's people kind of coming once and not coming back. So they're kind of coming, but they're not sticking around and doing stuff. I don't know if that's because there's a whole load of Jupyter notebooks that, that go with this. And this is the introduction to research programming. And they're on Anaconda Cloud. So you can actually just go and download them. 
So I don't know if people are going, seeing the notebooks are somewhere else and, and just doing them separately, or if they, they just don't like what we've done. I need to kind of find out, but I'm not sure. And um, the same with the... This is Introduction to Unix Shell. Quite a few people in Germany, for some reason. Um, again, quite a, quite a big spread. We've got Asia there, but a similar sort of story. A lot of people are coming in, seeing it once and, and disappearing again. So now we've built it. We know that for most people it should be fairly accessible, but they're not sticking around and going through stuff. So, so that's another challenge for us completely. At the same time, this, this is my side hustle. This is um, an idea for data literacy for 16 to 24 year olds that came out of the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference in Vancouver last year. So we realized that we wanted to do all this brilliant stuff with data and we wanted to support students and we knew they'd need to give informed consent, but we knew from working with students that they weren't anywhere near as informed as, as they needed to be. So last year, the Royal Society published a report on machine learning um, just for the UK. Only 10% of the UK population had ever heard of, of the phrase machine learning and had a vague idea of what it was. That's it. So, you know, when they're signing up to Facebook and Twitter and Google, they really don't know what they're truly consenting to. So we're like, okay, but we need to fix this. So the idea is that this playground will have three zones and we'll start with curated resources around data and means of personal data, the relationship with data and academia. So do you open up your, your, your research data? How does that conflict with publishing and your agreements? And then the data and society element. So at MozFest last year, I played the Open Data Institute's Open Data Game Datopolis to get people thinking about data and society. And about 20 people sat on the floor playing an open data board game. And they loved it. And a lot of people say, well, where do I get it? Actually, it lives in GitHub, and you can download and print it off yourself. OK, that they don't print them as such anymore. But this has a different set of issues. I had to create a set of series of documents to make them accessible for people to want to join the project. There's only a couple of us at the moment that are trying to push this as a great idea. And I've got this lined up for the Mozilla Global Sprint that happens in May. I'm also coaching a couple of other different projects. And we're hoping to take it to MozFest to help us build this. But this is open. It will be OBR. Again, it's open source hosting GitHub. But my problem here is different. I don't have the collaborators yet, whereas I kind of I did before. So they're OBRs, but the problems are, are quite different. So I kind of wanted to summarize and go, when it comes to open and, and education, and just education in general, everyone starts at a different place. So because I was a teacher, because I studied IT and education, anyway, I have this vocabulary around pedagogy and teaching. I have an understanding of how technology fits with education because I study technology and I taught technology. That, that, that's what I do. I'm a technologist. But not everyone sees that or they, they see the braid between what they're doing and, and the how the technology can help them. And we need to be much more inclusive and not just accessible. So we need to be inclusive about the examples that we use, the language that we use, the people that come and test things and build it with us, because they need to be present there as well. Um, and we need to think about accessible as not just in the, well, can anyone access it from any device anywhere? As in, we need to think about various um, needs for different users. Choosing a license is hard. You will come into conflict. IP is always a bit tricky. And... With any kind of learning, it always takes a lot longer than you think to build it and decide and to get these things rolled out. So at that point, I'm going to stop and say if you've got any questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. Or if you've come up with anything else that's kind of equally as tricky and uh, that would be great. OK. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Sam. That was a great presentation. Um, I have had a question come in through Twitter, which I could do, uh, but I'd like to go to the room first, if I may. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, and if you could raise your hand in the usual way. Martin Poulter has raised his hand. I really like the, les I really like the lessons learned, thank you, and especially that choosing a license among Creative Commons is hard. Uh, some of your content, did I get this right? Some of your content is on YouTube. Right, so the videos I put in YouTube because they're a lot easier to caption. Right. All the content lives live in GitHub. So they're hosted through GitHub, but the 
so we've got readings, right. which are expanded versions of the content in Jupyter Notebooks because they are practical coding exercises. But you can download the notebooks themselves from Anaconda Cloud. So everything's built with free tools. Right. And but openly. you're using some commercial platforms for some aspects of dissemination. Um, right. So the yeah. only reason why they're in YouTube is because our own tool for hosting videos is not very good at captioning. It's actually a lot easier to do it in YouTube. So, so getting a benefit from a commercial service. Yes. And you're thereby you're making that commercial service more valuable and giving more reasons for people yeah. to go to that. So it's not you're against people making money from it. It's um, so long as they're doing something useful yeah. adding value. So actually, it's the non-commercial, putting a non-commercial clause actually doesn't capture your intentions for the No, for the so if a tool is useful to me, I, I will use it. Right, YouTube to me in this instance is exceptionally useful. It allows me to auto caption, and people could then choose the language that they like, w what works for them, and, and that's great. Yeah. But it's that's slightly different in that. So all this work is CC BY. When it comes to my own work, if I put a lot of time and effort into it, and I want to share it for the greater good, I then have a conflict of, or well, then am I happy for someone to take that and then publish it and make money from it if I'm not necessarily recognized in, in any way for it. I faced it, I don't want to hog the mic, I faced exactly the same decision and uh, the same choice and uh, another solution, I don't know what the right solution is, is to release it CC by SA or yeah. CC by because someone, if someone's business model is to sell something which they can get easily for free, that's not a very good business model. No. So that's a way to discourage that commercial exploitation. Yeah. Uh, there's another question behind uh, Matthew. Sorry. Oh, hi there. Um, thanks Thank you. so much for your uh, your comments. I'm really interested when you described how you had this sort of heightened awareness of accessibility because of your background as a secondary school teacher. Yeah. I'm just wondering, as someone who's worked on both the school side and the HE side, what differences you've seen between the use of OERs? Um, I, I said this earlier in a, in a discussion, actually, that um, so on a secondary level, sometimes you share by default you'd be asked to write a scheme of work and produce the resources for it that you're going to share with your department anyway because you're all teaching year nine the same thing at the same time. You're not going to write the same scheme of work six times. One of you writes it and you share it. And if it's any good, you share it with your colleagues in another school. And then if it's really good, you might think about uploading it to TES. But, but usually that's a little bit too scary. So, so you don't because... But, but it, it's, it's kind of a different... Because you are teaching the same things, because you've got a national curriculum, it's easier to, to share... I think, and there's more of a culture of borrowing and sharing, I think, because I think the research agenda skews what academics do. So there's more of a, it's my IP, whereas kind of compulsory, we, we don't kind of care quite so much, I don't think, to the same extent, really. And having worked in consortia teaching specialist diplomas, we would share across the consortia. So we weren't worried, really, in the same way. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting answer, and I like that question too. Thank you. Um, have we any other questions or any other comments people would like to make? Um, I'm not seeing any. Any. I've decided not to do the question on uh, uh, Twitter because I think it's a pretty straightforward answer. The okay. question was just... I mean, why are you you're using uh, GitHub? But I mean, obviously, uh, forkability and the fact that the people that are actually making the materials are there anyway. Yeah. Yeah? OK. So thank you very much once again, Sam, for a fantastic uh, presentation and some great answers. Thanks very much. So next up. We are pleased to welcome Rupert uh, Gatti, who will be talking uh, Publish in Practice, um, Open Access uh, Textbooks. It's a nice link there because UCL have also been very active in publishing open textbooks.